solution of evolvability. Um, uh, we're also interested in um, problems like, you know, recovery from mass extinction events, punctuated equilibrium, lineage structures, and then I'm personally very interested in problems of macroevolution and multi-level selection. Uh, so those are some of the motivations for the evolutionary dynamic studies, although we haven't gotten anywhere near answering any of these, any of those, you know, higher level questions with the models I'll be telling you about yet. Um, for the experimental work, uh, in terms of population dynamics, we're interested in looking at um, dynamics of clinical interve intervention in terms of treating bacterial infection, evolution of drug resistance, stress responses, um, and also how there's an interplay between the individual and population levels. Um, so that's some of the broader context. Um, but more specifically, I'm going to tell you first about some computational studies in evolutionary dynamics, uh, where we, we observe phase transition behavior, and then some experimental studies in population dynamics with yeast and E. coli, where we also observe what looks like phase transition behavior. Um, and so I'm going to try to efficiently spend about 10 minutes going through each of those. So let's start with the uh, computational work. And this is going to be a quick overview. There's, of course, a lot more detail. We've been working on this for about 10 years. There's a ton of extra detail that, that I won't have time to go through. But a quick overview. Um, we're looking at a computational model um, for evolutionary dynamics for organisms that are just represented by dots in a phenotype space. So very, very much a physicist's eye view, you know. Um, and in our model, we can simulate either assortative mating where organisms mate with someone who is very phenotypically similar. And this, this picture was a more culturally relevant a few years ago. This is uh, Circe and Jamie from Game of Thrones, but anyway. Um, and uh, we can also have uh, organisms that split and undergo um, bacterial fission. So two different reproduction schemes. Uh, we're defining clusters or species by reproductive isolation. So we look at who mates with whom, who their mate mates with, and so on to form this isolated reproductive cluster. Um, and uh, some other details of the, about the model. Um, there's a fitness, which is the number of offspring that an individual will have, uh, or a pair of individuals will have. And so there's this fitness landscape underlying the organisms. Um, and that can be a random, a changing landscape, it can be a flat neutral landscape, it can be uh, rugged but not changing, there can also be feedback so that we can do this in lots of different ways. Most of the more rigorous results I'll show you are, are, are all on a flat neutral landscape. Um, so what happens is the organisms reproduce. And so this is an example of a sort of mating, you have parent one, parent two, they're near each other. And so they're going to generate a certain number of organisms. Um, and the organisms can be uh, scattered either uniformly, uniform random distribution or a uh, Gaussian distribution um, in an area around the parents that's bounded by what we call the mutability, which is basically the maximum mutation size, the maximum distance that an, uh, an offspring can be from the parent. And if you're thinking about this from a mathematical point of view, it's, you know, you can definitely think of this in the context of a random branching random walk. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit as well. Um, so after we have this reproduction phase, there's also a death phase and organisms can um, die based on a random, you know, random epidemic sweep, you know, certain percentage die every generation. Um, we also have boundary conditions, they fall off the edge of the world. Um, and then they also, um, if there are two organisms that are too close to each other, they, uh, one of them will randomly die. So basically what I'm describing is something that can be thought of as a branching random walk. In, in a space. Um, and so what we, want, what we wanted to do was to look at how that um, model evolves as a function of the mutability. So uh, this um, summarizes some of the early results that we, that we had. This is from the very first version of the model that um, Nathan Dees and I developed. And so what I'm showing here in the top panel is the average population size. In this case, it's averaged over only five runs. In the later data I'll show you, it's averaged over like a thousand. But um, average population, um, and then the number of clusters with that clustering algorithm I mentioned, uh, as a function of the maximum mutation size. So we hold mu constant, run the simulation, 
plot the results, and so on. And so what you see is a sharp rise in the population size and a sharp rise in the number of clusters. And again, if you think about this, for people who've worked on you know, percolation and random walks, this may seem quite reasonable, um, and I think it is. <laughs> um, but uh, what we, we were definitely struck when we first saw this by the sharp rise and also by the fact that there's it's very large error bars um, at this inflection point. And for people who've looked at phase transitions and critical phenomena, this is indicative or it's, this could be consistent with um, a second order phase transition or a continuous phase transition. Um, if you think about this in terms of what's going on in individual um, runs at this critical range here, um, what this translates into is that there's a great deal of highly contingent behavior within the critical range. And this again is something that, you know, for physicists looking at critical phenomena, it's really not gonna be a surprise. But if you think about it biologically, it's also quite intriguing. So, you know, for this critical range, basically what's happening is you can have a, a system that either goes extinct, like the time series shown by this black trace, which leads to this. So this picture down here is the population on a rugged landscape. Um, the axes have arbitrary units, by the way. Um, I can talk more about the details of the model later in questions. Um, so here they're almost extinct, but for identical parameters, a different run, they survive very, very well. And again, physicists may not be that surprised by that, but from a biological or evolutionary biology point of view, this is very intriguing in terms of, you know, ideas like Stephen Jay Gould's idea of re replaying the tape. I mean, for anyone who's read um, Wonderful Life, talking about the Cambrian explosion. Um, so there are interesting, you know, um, implications in terms of historical contingency, um, considering this as an evolutionary model. So what we wanted to do, of course, was to dig into this in a more rigorous way. And what you saw in the previous slide was showing um, a rugged landscape. But of course, we want to simplify things. We want to try to look at a control case, look at something that is more you know, mathematically tractable. And so we decided to look more carefully at a neutral landscape where every organism has the same fitness. And you can consider this um, from a um, biodiversity uh, standpoint as something like the unified, the neutral theory um, suggested by Stephen Hubble for um, um, plant growth and, and distribution of other species. Or you could think of this as uh, the idea of genetic drift. Um, so um, when we do that, and this made up um, the bulk of the doctoral dissertation um, uh, for Adam Scott and for Don King, if you look at things on a flat landscape and change the parameter mu, you also get the same sort of clustering. Um, but since it's on a flatter landscape, you don't have um, the uh, spatial variability. And so it's much easier to analyze you know, in, in a rigorous way because you've removed one major source of noise. So um, if you look at population versus mutability, um, for the neutral landscape, and this is showing it for the assortative mating case, similar results for bacterial splitting. Um, so again, you see this sharp rise and same thing for the clusters. And so what Adam, um, Adam Scott did was to look at this and look at what happens to the error bars. Uh, there's a very, very large rise clearly. And so what he wanted to do was to, to see whether this really does behave like um, a continuous critical phase transition. And this does look like um, directed percolation. Uh, I know this is not a coffee percolator. Um, yeah, it's the wrong kind of coffee, but whatever. Um, so directed percolation is a type of uh, continuous second order non-equilibrium phase transition where you have a transition, it's not equilibrium because you're going to the absorbing state of extinction. Um, and if you look at the definitions of um, directed percolation from you know, standard textbooks on non-equilibrium um, phase transitions, you're going from a fluctuating active state to a unique absorbing state. Uh, there's a non-negative order parameter. We can use various things like population or number of clusters for the order parameter. The dynamical rules are short-ranged, which is true with our bacterial splitting or um, 
assortative of mating. And then you have this uh, reaction diffusion process, um, two spatial dimensions, one time dimension, uh, or you can go to death, you can go to reproduction, and you can go to coalescence. Um, I should mention here to fit with these rules, we really need to be focusing on uh, the bacterial splitting version of the model rather than the assortative mating um, in order to satisfy this repro reproduction uh, criteria. And so other than having some temporal disorder with the built-in randomness in the model, this basically satisfies um, what's known as the directed percolation conjecture uh, for Grasberger and Janssen. Um, and so what Adam wanted to do was to look at the critical exponents uh, and see if this fits directed percolation. And I know I need to speed up here a little bit because I want to make sure that I have time to get to the experimental work. Um, so what Adam did was to look at um, these different uh, measures as a function of the off critical measure or the distance difference between um, immutability and the critical value of the immutability and to look for these different critical exponents. Um, and if I were doing the full talk about the, the computational work, I'd go in, into more detail about what, what these each are. Um, and so what Adam did was to use various techniques, including you know, um, data collapse, uh, critical quench simulations, and he calculated these critical exponents uh, for this model. This is for the bacterial splitting model on a flat landscape, and found that the exponents are pretty similar to the predicted ones, the theoretically predicted ones for directed percolation, which we were extremely interested in and you know, quite excited to see. But the story does get more complicated in ways that I'm not gonna have time to go into because I wanna show you some experimental stuff. So first of all, there are other uh, control parameters. So the percentage death, for example, can be used as a control parameter. And you can look at a parameter space plot and look at you know, the phase transition in a two-dimensional parameter space. And looking at the death parameter, you can actually do the death parameter several different ways. And using that as a, um, the, the control parameter is one of the major things that Dawn King worked on in her dissertation. Um, also, um, you can, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. I'm trying to move your pictures just to make sure that I, know what I have on my screen here. Um, so other control parameters make the, make the story more complicated. Also, there are certain assumptions that Adam made where if you question those assumptions, it turns out that the system does diverge from behaving like directed percolation. And this relates very much to the underlying uh, noise, the quenched randomness in the system. And a lot of that is the work that was done by Stephen Ordway. Um, and so this, you know, Adam's work is correct up to a point. Uh, if you go a bit deeper, um, look at things, you know, changing a few assumptions, particularly in terms of whether you assume that that beta exponent is equal to beta prime. Um, if you question that assumption, things start to diverge from direct percolation. And that's some of the stuff that's in um, Stephen's dissertation. And we're working on a paper for that now. Um, so lots more that can be said about this model, but um, I wanna move on to the experimental work in a moment. One other thing to throw in though, um, there are a lot of other things we've looked at with this, particularly this is from some of Dawn's work, using coalescence theory, looking at the lineage structures uh, as a function of a critical parameter. This um, slide is showing um, lineage structures as a function of one of the death parameters as the critical parameter, not the mutability. Um, but basically you can see a sharp change and what we think is also a phase transition in the behavior of the system in terms of the lineage structures. And you can analyze this with coalescent theory. And one of the things that we're doing on the computational side right now is working on uh, how the lineage structures change in response to a simulated mass extinction and how the recovery is different uh, depending on how close you are to a critical value. Um, and, and of course, we are interested in ultimately relating this to actual biological data um, over the long term. So um, I guess I'd better hurry up here. Um, so I, let, me, let me get into the experimental work. Um, and so we also wanted to look, of course, at experimental systems. And this idea um, for setting this experiment up really is due to John King, 
and also, also we should acknowledge this is partly inspired by the types of studies from Jeff Gore's group at MIT. So uh, Dawn, um, when she actually was working as a postdoc in the group after she defended, uh, set up this collaboration with Wendy Olivas, who's a yeast biologist, um, to do the, these you know, serial dilution experiments to look at uh, yeast behavior, um, the population dynamics, um, under various stressors. And again, this is going from evolutionary dynamics to population dynamics, because if a population of yeast dies, you know, in your flask over a few days, obviously that's population death. It's not extinction in an evolutionary sense. Um, but what we're interested in was, you know, how populations decline and whether there is phase transition type behavior that can be observed here as well. So we do this serial dilution experiment. I guess I'm going to go through um, um, the experimental details kind of quickly, we can come back to that. And I have that on, on other slides later. Uh, basically it's a serial dilution. And what we're looking at is um, the number of doublings, which is calculated from the optical density. Um, and this work, again, the idea came from Dawn. Uh, Stephen Ordway did a lot of the work on this the experimental work. And this is a chapter in his dissertation also. Um, so uh, what we see, is first of all, um, if you look at the number of doublings for the yeast population uh, with a temperature stressor, you see this very, very sharp divergence in the behavior between the yeast at lower temperatures, um, sorry, at lower temperatures up here and higher temperatures down here. So they're not happy at higher temperatures. Biologists know that, that's not, that's not a, a big surprise. Um, but the sharpness of the change is something that not many other groups had, had observed. There was, there's a group, uh, Mencionitas et al, uh, that had seen a sharp change, but didn't look at it in, in terms of phase transition behavior specifically. Um, so, and th these are, uh, I, I'm leaving off the error bars. These are average numbers over multiple replicates. Um, and it looks very messy if the error bars are in there, but um, we really aren't basing this just on single points, I promise. Um, so there's this sharp transition. And if you want to kind of summarize all of this by plotting the temperature stressor um, on the x-axis versus number of doublings, so basically use the number of doublings as your uh, order parameter. Uh, so, and what we're doing here is plotting the average of the last three days population um, on the average of the last three days of doublings. Um, so we're averaging, you know, these three numbers. Um, so it's average or average of averages basically for the last three days after inoculation uh, at each temperature. And you see that there's this very sharp transition. And except for this large error bar, uh, you know, you see more variability in here. So this is a little bit indicative of a critical transition. Of course, since it's biological data, it's a lot you know, messier than, than the computational work. Then we wanted to look at salt stress. When you do that, you see that, you know, higher salt makes the cells less happy. Big surprise. I mean, most people doing biology would not be surprised at that. Um, but there's no big split in the behavior. And so if you plot um, number of doublings versus the control parameter again, you have this very, very gradual change rather than a sharp phase transition-like change. So what we're seeing is something that's sort of phase transition-like for one stressor, much more gradual change for another. And biologically, that probably does make sense because the biological response to temperature change is much more abrupt, whereas there are more um, mechanisms for buffering response to the changes in osmolarity that would come along with changes in salt concentration. So, we haven't tested this in terms of, you know, interrogating exactly why the difference is, but based on the literature, we can hypothesize that it would make more sense to have a more gradual change in response to uh, the salt stress. And I know I'm almost out of time here. So let me really quickly show you some of the coolest results, I think, which are E. coli studies. So we teamed up with Fred Inglis, uh, who's also a biologist, um, at, uh, at AMSOL and his group studies bacteria. And so what we looked at with his group was again, number of, of doublings, but, um, um, but as a function of antibiotic concentration. 
And we did this, this is again over multiple replicates. And I have the experimental details here. There won't be time to go through them, but I can come back to them if you want. Um, and also I can link to the paper uh, if you want to read the details. And so what we found was quite intriguing. So if you look at these different antibiotics, what you see is of course more antibiotic makes the E. coli less happy, big surprise, but the, the shape of the curve and the size of the error bars varies very significantly. So for spectinomycin, you know, goes down, but you know, in a much more gradual way, whereas you have this, these very sharp, uh, very large error bars when you're looking at um, an antibiotic like gentamicin. This is five other antibiotics, um, again, you know, some are much more gradual than others. What is really surprising is that the pattern of a sharp phase transition-like drop or a gradual drop does not seem to follow any pattern in terms of the type of um, antibiotic. So, so we see these patterns within and across antibiotic classes and mechanisms of action. And here's a, a table, you know, the different antibiotics, and you can go back and compare that to how they behave. And there is no general rule, which is quite surprising and intriguing. Uh, so that's definitely one of the things we want to ask. Um, and Fred and I are planning to, you know, to work on some grants to try to dig much deeper into that. Um, so that's, okay, I'm at 1024, that's not so bad. I have one, one slide one slide left and one minute left, perfect. So basically we are frantically working on what comes next. You can see the students writing papers and Fred Inglis and me writing grants here. Um, and so with the, the experimental work, particularly we're focusing on the E. coli, we're interested in, in you know, what determines the shape of the population collapse curve? Are there particular mutations? What happens if you do experimental evolution studies? Um, so that's the direction that we're interested in going. And of course, this relates to, you know, um, individual level mutations versus population level responses, antibiotic resistance, you know, clinical applications. So we're interested in all those different aspects. And then computationally, what we're working on now, oops, sorry, what we're working on now is looking at the divergence from directed percolation, which is in Stephen's dissertation. We're drafting a paper on that now. And then we're looking at lineage structures during recovery from simulated extinction. That is a parenthesis that should not be there. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, those are the things that, you know, hopefully will have interesting new results over the next few years. Um, and again, just wanted to go back and thank all the wonderful collaborators, particularly the former grad students um, who've worked so incredibly hard on, on the project. Uh, here's my email if anybody wants to uh, follow up beyond the scope of this talk. So that's it for now. Thanks very much for being here. And any questions, I'm here. Thanks, Sonia, for a wonderful talk. So we have, uh, we are starting to get some questions. So I will read out the first question. So this is from Aditya M. And they are asking, uh, usual discussions of phase, uh, phase transitions involve taking a thermodynamic limit and going to infinity of the number of constituents. Mm -hmm. Is that relevant for your experimental work? In other words, are you observing collective or individual properties? If individuals, should we think of them as phase transitions per se? Right, so we are, we're definitely looking at finite populations, um, of course, but um, we are looking at the, you know, finite populations with as many replicates and with as large as possible um, populations as we can. And so, you know, we're getting as close to the large population limit as we can within an experimental system, you know? And so we are, we are looking at, um, we, you know, our order parameters are intended to measure collective properties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there definitely are size effects and that's something that I didn't, I guess I showed that, but didn't mention it. Uh, in um, one of the pictures of uh, Adam's results, I actually had multiple curves and they were for different sizes of the landscape. Um, they're for different population sizes. So you definitely can look at the behavior of the system as the population gets larger and larger. We also can look at the behavior of the system as time, you know, as we run this, this system for more and more, you know. Um, so, um, 
so basically, I guess, yeah, just to sort of wrap up a, an answer to that, you know, we're, we're, we're going for collective behavior with large finite populations. Mm -hmm. So, and, and yeah, we, we definitely know that, you know, we're not, you know, we, we can't make assumptions about a thermodynamic limit because this is, you know, finite computers and finite flasks. Um, yeah. yeah. And the same is true for simulations, yeah. right? There oh, still are totally. finite size effects. So I guess you could check for finite size effects. Uh, so the next yes. question is from Rubain Bruinsma. And Rubain is asking, could you discuss why mutability causes population increase in the first part? Yes, definitely. And so it, there's a balance between the mutability parameter and what we call the overpopulation limit. And so one of the things that's baked into the model is that if two organisms are too close to each other, um, then one of them will randomly die. And that's to simulate evolutionary competition. And, and one thing I didn't say at the very beginning that maybe I should have, you know, we, what Nate and I originally tried to do when we designed the first baby version of this model was to develop a computational model that was as simply as possible, including the fundamental components for evolutionary dynamics of variability, overpopulation, uh, and inheritance. Um, and so the overpopulation kind of comes in with this overpopulation parameter. And so the value, the critical value of the mutability parameter is also determined by where the overpopulation limit parameter is set. Mm -hmm. And so if you change the overpopulation parameter, you'd have a different critical value for the mutability. And we're holding the overpopulation parameter constant in all these simulations. And so basically, as the mutability gets larger, the babies get far enough away from each other that they don't stifle each other in the nest. So it's a balance of the parameters in the model. Um, and you can go back to that in terms of, I don't know if it's worth time-wise me going back here. Um, so um, it's the balance between the reproduction, which is the, mu per, the mutability parameter and the coalescence parameter, which is governed by that overpopulation limit. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, that, definitely very important question. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. Thank you, Sonia, once again for this wonderful talk. And we will have more time for questions for you at the end of you know, both talks. So, uh, so thank you again.